this idea that somehow we can impose pay targets from the outside to override strategy kind of betrays a complete lack of understanding about how governance works in companies. Innovations in Sustainable Finance, a University of St. Gallen podcast by Julian Kölbel. Hello and welcome to another episode of Innovations in Sustainable Finance. I'm Julian Kölbel, Assistant Professor of Finance at the University of St. Gallen, and I'm really excited to have today on the show Tom Gosling, and we're going to talk about ESG incentives. Tom, welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Julian. Great to be here. Fantastic. So uh, you have a lot of experience with uh, boards, with CEO compensation, um, and I'd like to invite you, uh, before we start, to introduce yourself a little bit and, and what you do and what you care about. Sure. I mean, and certainly in relation to this discussion, probably the most relevant thing is that I um, established PwC's executive pay consulting practice in London um, about uh, around the turn of the millennium and for 20 years uh, led that practice and consulted with the boards of major European companies um, on a whole range of compensation uh, issues. Uh, I left uh, PwC in 2020 to uh, return to academia. I'm now um, an executive fellow at London Business School and also with the European Corporate Governance Institute. Um, I'm interested in um, a number of topics, but one of them is still executive pay, but also um, sustainable investing and, and various other ESG topics. And part of what I do is try to create a bridge between academics and the practitioner and policymaker world uh, on uh, on a range of these issues. And um, part of what we'll talk about today, I'm sure, is the outcome of a, a series of studies that I've done now with my academic hat on, but in conjunction with my old firm, PwC, where we studied various aspects of uh, market practice and some of the issues relating to the linkage of um, executive pay to ESG targets. Thank you, Tom. And yes, that's exactly what, what we're going to address, of course. Um, it's a real pleasure to have you here and, and, and have a conversation about this topic. Um, so in that very interesting report, or that, that, that was one anyways, that you wrote uh, together with, with former colleagues, I suppose, from PwC, uh, published in 2021, one of the findings is that 37 of the FTSE 100 companies, uh, they have ESG in their annual bonus with an average weight of 15%. That's a number that struck me because I was supposing that ESG compensation is perhaps a thing that people talk more about that it's actually done, but but this suggests that it's actually uh, being practiced quite a bit. So can you, you know, based on the report, but perhaps going beyond that, what, what are some of the trends that you're seeing that's actually happening there on that front? I uh, said so that report you've referenced was the first in a series of three. And although it's only 2021, it's, it's already out of date. I mean, over the last three to four years, there has been an explosion in the praxis of linking executive pay to ESG targets. Um, and when we did a follow-on report in um, 2022, um, then that, that proportion had gone up to around 75% of companies were linking executive pay to ESG targets in some way, shape or form. And the latest data suggests that that's getting closer to 90%. So it's something that has really you know, increased at a very rapid rate, um, you know, in line, in tune with you know, the whole kind of expectation uh, on businesses that they take a more kind of uh, stakeholder oriented and environmentally conscious approach to the way they do business. And I think there's been some interesting developments in the type of targets that are being put in place because I mean, the, the, there have been ESG targets in pay for a long, long time. You know, so companies have had measures relating to employee welfare, health and safety. If you think of extractive industries, they've had targets relating to community relations and um, you know, environmental impacts for some time. But now it's gone mainstream across all industries. And we've also seen a, a big shift in two directions. So one is towards what we call the sort of the new ESG categories, which are a little bit more concerned with the company's impact on the outside world, as opposed to the outside world's impact on the company. So we've seen a big growth in targets around climate change, for example, but also targets around diversity and inclusion. 
So one big trend has been the change in the nature of the measures. And the second big trend has been, you know, although it's most common for these measures to be in the annual bonus, their use in long-term incentive plans has also become much more common. Very interesting. So, so, so it is really uh, a very widespread practice, mm. but it is a complex thing, isn't it, to to sort of figure out how that should be done and 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 whether that really ultimately works. Um, maybe we can speak about that. I heard one executive say, um, and I don't know if that's representative, but but uh, this person said, well, investors want us to link pay to ESG performance, but when we ask back to which metric we should tie it, there's a bit of silence on the other end. So so can you perhaps speak to that challenge that comes once you start digging? It, it seems like a simple idea on the surface, but it seems actually very complex once you start digging in. Yeah, it is. And, um, you know, and maybe we'll get into in due course some of the sort of unintended consequences that come from the practice. But let's just start with this point about targets. And what's quite interesting is that um, the work that we did included um, a survey of investors uh, in, in the second of the three reports. We, we surveyed investors globally, as well as surveying senior leaders about pay practices. And quite an interesting divergence emerged there. So senior mm -hmm. leaders within organizations tend to prioritize the um, ESG metrics that they view as being most closely connected to value creation in their business. So measures relating to employee health and safety, employee satisfaction, you know, these sort of, the, the, that employee channel for value creation is very important. Whereas what we see from investors is that they're starting to prioritize some of the issues that they're coming under pressure on from their clients. So decarbonization was viewed as, you know, was the most highly cited target by uh, by investors as being appropriate for inclusion in pay. So just to get really specific on that, around 70% of investors felt that decarbonization was a good measure to have in pay schemes, whereas for senior leaders, that was only about a third of, of, of companies felt that. And I think that's because, you know, senior leaders within companies are very aware of the specific ESG issues that are actually material to them. Whereas I think some of the investor debates has got a little bit kind of generic and is a little bit more focused on the issues that are important to society. And those are being translated into demands on companies, whether or not it's a first order issue for the company in question. So I think this difference in perspective between investors and boards is quite significant, but also the difference is between investors. Because again, we have investors who are very much focused on this as being a mechanism for encouraging companies to think about their impact on the external world. And then we have another body of investors for whom this is still very much about focusing on uh, non-financial dimensions that create value for the company. So this sort of inwards versus outwards materiality perspective is also an area of difference. So it can be pretty tricky for companies to navigate this. And I think one of the problems sometimes, uh, and this happens a lot with executive pay, is that in an attempt to keep everybody happy, uh, pay plans can often have a little bit of everything in them. And uh, the result is that you just get a bit of a mess. Interesting. Tom, I would really appreciate if you can, um, from your experience, give us perhaps an example, a concrete example of a ESG compensation policy that you think is very well designed and perhaps one where you uh, think it it uh, it causes problems that is somehow ill designed. If if you can pull from your experience there, yeah. And and this we recently actually I can draw a couple of examples actually from um, a study we did, which was actually in conjunction not just with PwC but Sevian Capital, who is one of the investors there, and a European activist investor who very prominently kind of pushed this idea of linking pay to ESG targets. And um, we assessed, um, we honed in on climate targets because we felt that this is a fairly mature, well-developed, well-understood issue. And if we're going to see best practice anywhere, we should see it in climate targets in large European companies. And so we did a study of the top 50 companies and, um, and we measured them um, according to uh, four kind of quality criteria. Um, for the setting of targets. And um, those four criteria were that uh, the metric should be significant. So there should be a separate and meaningful percentage of the incentives uh, linked to pay, that it should be measurable. So targets should be objective and quantifiable. It should be transparent 
prospectively for investors, and there should be a clearly disclosed, disclosed link to the company's stated long-term climate goals. And the, under each of those four dimensions, we gave firms either nil point, you know, one point or, or, or two mm -hmm. points. And it wasn't a particularly high bar that we applied. And the first thing I'd say is that the quality of these targets, even in the area of climate, even in Europe, is generally pretty low. So only, you know, only seven of the uh, 50 companies got seven or eight out of the maximum eight points on what was not a particularly demanding standard. And there were many cases where the quality of targets was was candidly pretty poor. But if I think of some, you know, the companies that came out with good examples from that were um, uh, AstraZeneca in, in, in the UK, uh, Total Energies, uh, it, which is obviously controversial because having good climate targets doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing, you know, a great job for the environment, um, but also, um, you know, ABB. And, and, and what was interesting about each of those examples is that they did fulfill these criteria um, very explicitly. So they tended to focus on, you know, a key material goal, um, whether that was, you know, carbon emissions or, um, you know, low carbon uh, technologies. They had very clearly stated goals around it that investors were able to evaluate. And I think this really important point was that they clearly showed how these shorter term goals fitted against a longer term trajectory towards net zero that each of these companies had made. So those are the sort of criteria for, I think, well-designed measures that enable investors you know, to have a debate and a dialogue with companies about. I'm not going to name bad examples because I don't think that's ever particularly kind of constructive, but the ones that don't work well is when you have these huge long shopping lists of different measures that, I mean, you know, there was one example of a company that had 25 ESG KPIs making up 20% of the bonus. So each of these KPIs was worth next to nothing. There are examples of really feeble metrics like show climate leadership. I mean, what you know, what does that even what does that even mean? So, you know, I think that maybe that gives you an indication about what maybe represents good and good and bad practice. But there is a totally separate question here is that you know, the, 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 the assessment criteria that we used really looked at the, the quality of the target setting and disclosure. That doesn't say anything about whether the strategic ambition is good enough. Um, you know, and that's a totally separate question. Right. And, and maybe let's go after this strategic ambition. You already alluded to it that there are actually quite different reasons for setting targets in the ESG domain. Uh, and and I think you would separate it into targets that are seen as financially material, uh, that where the, sort of the, the longer term ambition would simply be to contribute to, to shareholder value. Or on the other hand, more sort of an impact objective where you would uh, like, as an investor, perhaps companies to pursue specific goals that are have an ambivalent relationship to shareholder value or perhaps even a negative one but but maybe you'll have that view as an investor that that's you know equally or even more important um and and these different reasons are are very very different aren't they mm -hmm. so maybe we can take them yeah. by turn the the question that i have about sort of um financially material esg indicators is that you would think they are somehow redundant if if they anyways at the end contribute to long-term shareholder value so why break yeah. them out as separate metrics yeah i mean and, and you know and that is a great question and um i mean you'll you know you'll you'll know that i mean alex edmonds for example at london business school has a view has exactly that view and that actually we should be focusing on lengthening the time horizon of pay rather than breaking out these separate metrics because once you break out the separate metrics you get all sorts of potential unintended consequences when you speak to senior leaders about why they're doing this, um, you know, there, are, there are really um, three reasons that they come up with. So one is they say, actually, there's a time horizons issue. So, you know, this is, um, these ESG factors may not feed into long-term value creation over a sufficiently quick time scale. 
uh, in order for them to be taken into account when people have quite short-term objectives around profits and so on and so forth. Now, Alex's counter-argument to that, for example, would be, well, just pay everybody over the longer term. But whilst that might work and be credible for CEOs, when you think about, you know, 1,000 managers, you know, incentivized through an organization, they are going to have operational profit and revenue goals for the year for the business that they operate. So, so one reason is to provide this kind of time horizon um, counterbalance. A second reason is signaling. So they definitely view putting these targets in pay as a way of signaling to stakeholders that they think it's important. It's a sort of putting your money where your mouth is um, argument. And um, there's then a third um, uh, uh, objective, which I think is quite interesting, particularly from investors, which is to say the process of putting these targets in pay creates a discussion about what the short-term goals are leading towards these longer-term aspirations. And this was really explicit in Sevian Capital and Allianz's view when they came out prominently in favor of ESG targets in pay. They said, look, all of you companies, you're setting 2050 net zero goals, and that's great. But, you know, that's kind of three, four, five CEOs into the future. What are you doing right now over the next three to five years towards these goals? And we have a mechanism of disclosure and voting and accountability around pay. So let's use that mechanism as a way to create accountability around the setting of short term pay targets. So that's sort of the you know, those are kind of the three reasons that are still consistent with a sort of shareholder value maximization view of the world. Uh, but which is why you might want to use these metrics in pay. Yeah, these are yeah, these are really good reasons, actually. I think to to also explain why why we see so much of that, and and I see the the tension a little bit between creating something that uh, that creates accountability at, at the corporate level, so that it's not all just cheap talk and and some fluffy objectives yeah. far and far away, but it it really bites, you know, it it's, it bites people's wallet, and and it is a credible signal to put this into the compensation package. I especially that point I can really see, and then the other concern view that this, you know, depending on how you pick those targets. Uh, I mean, there's this this famous line of of hitting the target and miss the point that that perhaps by making a small mistake in how this is measured, you actually get more manipulation than than manipulation on the target than performance on the real thing you were interested in. Right? That is that is one of the key concerns, isn't it? It's a massive concern, um, and you know, particularly. With ESG targets, there's, there's massive information asymmetry uh, between executive teams and their boards, let alone between boards and investors. So um, there's, you know, there's pretty high scope um, for that hitting the target, missing the point question. Um, you know, we also know, for example, it, when you look at um, performance on environmental pollution targets and carbon targets, they're frequently met through divestment. Um, you know, there's been some recent academic papers that have scrutinized that phenomenon quite well. And so there's a question about aggregate real terms um, reductions. I mean, in the area of diversity, for example, you know, targets may focus on um, demographic diversity at senior levels within an organization, which may be completely disconnected from what's happening culturally more broadly around inclusion through the organization. And indeed, there's some evidence that if you show progress on a sort of a superficial tip of the iceberg target, like board level diversity, then stakeholders stop worrying about that issue across a much broader set of dimensions and kind of assume that the base of the iceberg is okay as well, even, even though it may not be. So there are lots of opportunities, I think, in ESG for uh, that point of, you know, that hitting the target and, 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 and missing the point. And I think this is also reflected in the facts, which is kind of one of the other concerns about ESG targets in pay, is that they do consistently pay out at a higher level than other types of targets. So in general, you, you can sort of split executive pay targets into three buckets. You've got completely objective targets based on relative total shareholder return, for example, market-based targets, which are almost impossible for management to influence or manipulate other than through performance. You've then got targets that relate to things like return on capital, cash flow, 
where there's a bit more scope for short-term behaviors to manipulate them, but there's sufficiently strong investor understanding about what good looks like, that there's a strong level of accountability. And then we have sort of strategic and ESG targets where candidly, there's a lot of latitude for executives to meet those targets. Uh, and it's quite difficult for sufficient scrutiny to be applied. And we see, for example, amongst those top 50 European companies, climate targets are paying out at the median at 100% and on average at around 90% of the maximum when we're clearly taking insufficient action on climate change. So, you know, there's this sort of disconnect between how these targets are paying out and their aspiration. And I think there's a real risk that when we have ESG targets in pay, we just end up with more pay and not more ESG. Yes, I was I was thinking just that. So the targets, if you, as you describe it, they seem to work for executives, uh, and that they they meet all the targets. One one question is which measure do you take? But then the other crucial question is, of course, how do you calibrate that? So on that metric, whatever yeah. it may be, uh, you know, carbon emissions are perhaps an, an obvious one, and then you have to decide is it scope one, two, or also three. And then you have to say, well, the baseline is going to be 2019 and we want to see, you know, 10% improvement uh, adjusted by revenue. And sort of there's so many assumptions and uh, it, it's just really, isn't it really difficult to set this threshold? It, it is really difficult. And, and I think my own view is that I think we have charged headlong into this practice without really thinking through properly how, how to make it effective. So I think that ESG targets in pay uh, work most effectively when a, a several conditions are met. Firstly, it has to be aligned with the strategy. Okay, so companies that are adopting a new, maybe more ESG oriented strategy frequently do use pay as a tool to reinforce that through the business. So, you know, we should recognize that this is a tool that management teams believe is useful for driving performance. But that is when the board has already, you know, with the CEO's endorsement and support, adopted a strategy that, that takes those factors into account. I think sometimes we assume that we can kind of force a board to adopt a more ESG-oriented strategy by imposing ESG targets into the pay plan. And that, that just doesn't work. So it has to start with the strategy. And you can't make up for a deficient strategy through throwing metrics into pay plans. I think the second thing that makes it effective is when there's a clearly material ESG issue that is first amongst equals for the company, because this means that the chances are it's understood. There's a clear requirement to increase ambition to move from A to B, which helps with the calibration question and you're not just paying for the day job. And you overcome some of these potential unintended consequences of distorting focus onto the measure that you've put in the pay plan. Because actually, if it's massively the most material issue, it kind of doesn't matter if you've got that distorted focus. And then I think the third thing that really helps is if you've got a very knowledgeable anchor investor who can help apply scrutiny. So for that reason, if you're Sevian Capital and you invest in 15 companies in Europe and that's all you've got in your portfolio, you, you know more about those companies than the boards probably do, right? So you're incredibly well-placed to provide scrutiny to the target-setting process. But in too many cases, we've got investors facing this, you know, diffuse set of dispersed shareholders, none of whom really has the capability to apply proper scrutiny. So I think instead of focusing this practice on the situations in which it can work, we've, we've just allowed it, we've spread it willy-nilly across the market with the result of which we have a lot of very poor quality implementations that are, that are probably not doing much other than, yet again, undermining the credibility of executive pay in the eyes of stakeholders. Yeah, so, so maybe let's drill into that, um, that second objective of, of the whole practice as well, rather than simply... Uh, boost long-term shareholder value, perhaps to um, get corporations to take more care of issues that we care for um, from a societal point of view and not necessarily from a, from a pure shelter point of view. Um, 
So I liked your two, uh, I think it were two points, right? Sort of first, it's important that the strategy is already aligned with that and or that there's an anchor investor who who really knows the company who can mitigate some of the information asymmetry issues here. Perhaps as a first question, I was curious, has anyone checked? So do companies that have targets or perhaps let's say have good targets, are they moving any faster than those that don't? So um, I think there are two levels to that. I mean, there is some evidence that that setting stated targets um, improves performance on pretty much any dimension on which you set the target, but that's not the same as linking it to pay. So, you know, so companies that, you know, put out into the market, uh, you know, a commitment that, that they're going to do something do tend to do more of that thing. Now, and then we'll come back to, um, you know, whether there are sort of funny ways in which you can achieve it. But when, when you come down to the pay question directly, uh, the evidence is is much weaker. So there are a couple of papers um, that look at this question that have um, come out um, pretty recently, actually. And um, yeah, they look at, um, I mean, the problem with them all is that it's very difficult to um, identify uh, causality. So there's a there's a 2023 paper, Carter, Palikzek and Zong, who, who find that ESG contracting correlates with 5% higher ESG scores, um, but you know, five percent is you know is 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 pretty small. I mean, that was that improvement in ESG scores was something like um, an eighth of a standard deviation of the between company scores. And you know, I think the problem, and there's another paper by Cohen, Kadak, uh, or Mazabal, and uh, Reichelstein that's that's just recently come out that finds a similar kind of finding. But the problem is. You know, my experience has been that the companies that put targets in pay historically have been the ones that um, actually prioritize uh, ESG dimensions of performance. So the thing that's still untested is whether putting targets in pay of, as it were, unwilling companies causes them to do more on these dimensions than they otherwise would have done. I mean, that at the moment is a completely untested question. But even the evidence that we've seen to date suggests that if there are impacts, they're pretty small. Uh, and I think the issue is, is, is the following. The first thing is that, you know, this idea that somehow we can impose pay targets from the outside to override strategy kind of betrays a complete lack of understanding about how governance works in companies, right? So CEOs basically set strategy which is endorsed by the board and they own the strategy. Having endorsed the strategy, the board then sets pay targets that are in line with that strategy. So a, a board compensation committee is never going to say, well, CEO, we really like your strategy, but actually we don't like the carbon ambition in it. So we're going to superimpose this sort of carbon target that's more stretching than is in your strategy. That, that's just not going to happen. They're going to set targets that are aligned with the strategy. So if you haven't got the right ambition in the strategy in the first place, you're never going to correct that through the pay mechanism. If you have got an ambitious strategy, then pay may help reinforce accountability to deliver it. Absolutely. But you can't put the cart before the horse. I think that's a really, really important factor to, to acknowledge. The second one is that, you know, I think if you look at a lot of this stuff around disclosure, target setting, pay, I think that all of these things can help influence behavior at the margin but they're not strong enough to correct for a fundamental externality. So, you know, can you use pay targets to encourage companies to push at the boundary a little bit of what they could be doing on biodiversity or decarbonization? Yes, absolutely. But, you know, can a pay target drive a company to a 1.5 degree aligned strategy when actually that's not commercially viable for the company to do? No, absolutely. A pay target will never be strong enough to do that because there are so many other embedded incentives, uh, career concerns, um, but also the fact that pay is delivered in equity, that you know, you're only gonna have 15 to 20% of the pay based on these ESG targets. So you, we can't pretend that we can correct for fundamental externalities through the pay system, but that's not to say that we can't use it to sort of nudge things along a little bit in the right direction. Yeah. Yeah, no, that that makes a lot of sense. And, and I think a key thing about ESG targets, as you've alluded to before, as a signaling device, is that no one ever sees the strategy 
or I mean, at least you'd have to sort of look for it, right? Whereas whereas targets are very explicit, yeah. very visible. So so to the extent that they are a telltale of what the underlying strategy is, that there's 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 space for that, and and I can see how it how it is a complement to to the sort of you know perhaps not as explicitly stated strategy and underneath. Anyways, for you know, for optimistic investors who are not dealing with a company I, at, I think at a that's high level, right? And, and sorry, just to just to, sorry to interrupt you, Julian, just to build one point on that, that, that I think one of the things that was a really missed opportunity that came out of this study that we did on European climate targets is that an extraordinary number of these pay targets just sort of appear in a vacuum in the remuneration report and are not connected at all to the longer term strategic climate goals that the, the, the company is setting. And, you know, and presumably in the background, these targets are being connected with those goals. But actually, what was interesting was that it's just not presented in a way that enables investors to make that connection and to create that accountability. And, you know, there was a very interesting sort of live example of this a few years ago when um, Shell had announced in the in the autumn of 2017 its new net carbon footprint reduction strategy. And Dutch investors, uh, supported by UK investors, came along and said, very interesting, we now want you to put these targets in in, in pay, mm -hmm. in your term incentive plan. And one of the things that that undoubtedly did was that the dialogue around the pay targets did start to create this bridge between the, I think it was 2035 and 2050 targets that Shell had set. It created a bridge between those targets and the next five years. So I think done well, you know, this this can help, but too often the targets just seem to be kind of plucked out of the air. And again, this is the problem when the reality is investors are resource poor. They can only really engage in detail with a small percentage of companies each year. So if 100% of companies is introducing these targets, you know, there is a risk that a lot of them aren't facing a lot of scrutiny. A second point you you, you just brought up is, is that... Um... You know there are limits to to what such a target can achieve that are very much related to, you know, the size of the externality or or the, the cost, if you will, of the company to uh, to reach, you know, an ESG goal, as it were. And and climate change, I think, is a prime example. There are, you know, I mean, a blunt example is a, is a coal miner that you know produces some of the most uh, carbon intensive fuel in the world. Um, the the cost of not doing that uh, will be tremendous on the business. So uh, there's no amount of performance link uh, for the CEO that uh, will convince the CEO to to follow that that number because most of the compensation anyways will come from equity. And if you drive that down to zero, well, that's, you know, that's not what you're incentivized to do, right? So I think a critical uh, point is this, what we uh, mentioned, the sort of the relationship or the you know, sometimes this is uncertain. There's the presumed relationship between this goal and the bottom line. Um, and so I have two questions. Does it maybe, you mentioned biodiversity, right? Perhaps a, a target on, on an issue where it's not entirely clear uh, whether this is, you know, net a good or a bad thing to do. If you do a bit more of it, right, it, it you know, there might be some short-term costs, but there might be some long-term benefits. So, so when there's a bit of ambiguity around that, I think that seems to be an interesting space. And the other question I want to put to you is, if there's a lead investor who strongly pushes for a goal where they know this is not going to be in line with long-term shareholder value, what happens to all the other shareholders if they mm. succeed at getting that through? So, so let's start with the first case. And I think you're absolutely right. And I think this is a key distinction in that um, I think the most fruitful area um, actually around a lot of, you know, investor-based ESG activity, but including in pay, the most fruitful area is, is to operate in this zone of discretion that companies have right, around the strategies that they pursue that they think are going to create value over the long term. And, you know, if you, you know, you, there are, if you take biodiversity as an example, there are strategies where you lean into the idea of um, having a less harmful impact on um, biodiversity versus strategies that actually just ignore it and seek to minimize costs. They both are perfectly legitimately within the zone of discretion of directors. And actually, it's not clear which one of them is going to be more successful because you can make arguments for 
reputational considerations if you disregard the environment you know actually if you're at the vanguard of supply chain reorganization that could give you competitive advantage and often with you know so, um, a number of biodiversity related issues companies that have got into exploring how they can improve things in their supply chain find that they can deliver enormous environmental benefits at really quite a low cost so that's absolutely the area where pay can potentially play a role in just encouraging managers to view those trade-offs slightly differently. And I do think that's particularly important. I mean, we focus on CEO pay an awful lot in this discussion. Actually, that's particularly in crucial when you look at the operating manager level. I see. The operating manager who is tasked with annual profit and revenue and cost goals, you know, for whom the trade-offs are actually much less straightforward than for the CEO who is predominantly paid in long-term equity. So I think you're absolutely spot on that for those sorts of issues, um, it, it, is, it is fruitful to look at this as a way of reinforcing a different balance of priorities. I think on your second question about, well, what if you've got investors who, who want something that just isn't supporting long-term shareholder value? You know, what happens to the other investors? Um, well, you know, and this is where you come back to the fact that the directors are responsible for looking after the long-term health of the company. And it, it depends on the jurisdiction you're in and um, typically looking after the interests of investors as, as, as a whole. And so something that is economically very damaging for the company, it, it's very difficult for the, for, the, for the board directors to sign off on that, right? Very, very difficult. And so really the only way that um, a board of directors is going, you know, take your coal company example, the only way that they're going to say, okay, let's mothball all of these assets and write down the value and run the company into the ground, they're only going to do that if basically if they have a forcing shareholder resolution supported by a majority of investors that makes them do that and where the investors make it clear that if you don't do that, we're going to fire you and appoint a board that will. Because that is damaging to the economic prospects of the company. It's not obviously in the interests of investors unless investors explicitly tell you to do this. So, you know, that's not a terribly realistic scenario and and i do think sometimes that investors who you know typically we see maybe 20 percent of investors you know wanting these much more aggressive targets in companies and i think they just do need to think a little bit about you know can they find ways to ask for targets that actually align with something that could be long-term value creating for the company because they're much more likely to then be adopted by the board so if we take a really specific recent example around the European oil majors. So we've had this resolution around scope three targets and the investors that have been pursuing that would love those targets also to be linked to pay. But the problem is, you know, for, for an oil major, a scope three reduction is not necessarily a value maximizing strategy. Well, that would mean they sell uh, less oil, if I'm correct. They sell less yeah. oil, right? And, you know, they make less profits through that. Well, and actually, in practice, what it probably means is that they accelerate their divestment times table. So it's it's not even that the oil's being left in the ground. So it's not clear it produces much for the planet. On the other hand, I think encouraging oil majors to pivot to have more of a stake in the transition is, is a sort of a more fruitful direction, I think, for um, for these activists um, to go. The problem with that is that it does create reputational problems for the oil companies themselves. So, you know, the oil majors have generally paid out at pretty much close to the maximum on their uh, low carbon and environmental targets because they're all about, you know, developing new low carbon businesses. And, and that just jars with the idea that they're causing all of this problem mm. with climate change on the, you know, for the rest of their business. I'm not saying this is easy, but we have to recognize the reality of what directors' duties are what companies are going to have to do. And we have to find ways to go with the grain of that rather than banging our heads against a brick wall. Yes. Now, it seems uh, if if you are interested in, in you know, driving change more from an impact perspective, and it's certainly something that I'm interested in, in conceptually, yeah. you might want to pursue exactly as you put it, put it this, this zone of discretion, right? So, so there's no, not really a realistic chance to pursue anything that's you know, has an obvious negative relationship with long-term shareholder value. Uh, 
But it's also not true that this is just a binary thing, like in the sense of well, either it's good for shareholder value or it's not. There's actually, I think, more than some people realize, a, a, a zone where there's really not an, a whole lot of clarity. And, and exactly this short-term, long-term perspective comes in. Really like the point that you made about well, yeah, co CEOs that are compensated truly long term. I mean, even though this could be improved, but but managers who who actually call the shots in the field very often in these operationally important things, uh, you know, I'm thinking like, how do you run a plantation and and things like that, hmm. um, and they're they're incentivized year on year. Uh, so so there, it might really make a big difference if there's something that you you know you could surmise that over a couple of years this will actually you know be net neutral or positive to to put it in explicitly in the in the plan. Uh, there seems to be you know there seems to be room to actually drive some improvements uh, in in that zone of discretion. I like that term a lot. Yeah, I think I think that's right because and you know I think sometimes. I mean, I think this whole concept of sort of maximizing shareholder value in business is 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 a bit of a, a a bit of a red herring in a way because you know I mean having having worked in business, I mean the reality is that you you face massive uncertainty, right? You you know you you have a few different approaches that you can take. You have a little bit of data. You probably know that one or two of them are a really bad idea, and then you've got a few that might be good ideas, but you kind of don't really know, and so you kind of give it a try. And so this idea that ex ante there are projects that are approaches that kind of clearly maximize shareholder value just isn't kind of the way the world the world works and so i think what we can do is we can encourage you know we can encourage people to lean into some of these issues and trends and try and innovate at the boundary of what is commercially realistic and feasible for them to do um or we can encourage them not to do that and just to be very financially motivated and oriented on every decision they take and we don't really know which of those is going to be better over the long term so let's encourage people to innovate at the at the more you know helpful end of this in terms of um impacts on society and the environment so suppose we you know there we are operating in 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 that zone i think we're still stuck a little bit with the problem of you know concretely defining a target that will hold right that will not be subject to some manipulation that you somehow have a chance of observing from the outside any views on on how you might go about that so i think the first thing is that we do need to i think move away a little bit from this idea that are executive pay targets are a way to get these nasty CEOs to do stuff that they wouldn't do otherwise. <laughs> okay. I mean, that's just, that's just the wrong control mechanism and it's, and it's never going to work. So, um, ESG targets in pay work most effectively, um, within businesses when actually the, um, you know, you don't have this same information asymmetry. So the CEO and the CEO's executive committee is able to make the judgment about how performance has been delivered. They'll have the discretion to, um, you know, adjust payouts to reflect that. And so this mechanism is only going, really going to work in a business where there's a good faith intention by the board and the executive team to adopt an ESG oriented strategy. So once we adopt that mindset, then really we're doing what investors have to do on this largely, which is to delegate the job to the board and to, and, and, and to management. Um, and I think the problem is when we view it as a sort of control mechanism to correct for externalities, that's when we get into all of this idea that, well, you know, investors need to be imposing these targets. Now, that's not to say that there's no role for external scrutiny, but we just need to be realistic for where this is going to go. When it comes to external scrutiny and the utility of that, again, you know, um, it really all comes down to the level of information asymmetry between between investors and the board on the topic. And the more material the issue, the more widespread the issue, the more quantifiable and objective the issue, the more likely it is that investors are going to have some yardsticks by which to measure it. But even on an issue like climate, where actually we do have some pretty clear aggregate benchmarks about where we need to be going, um, at what pace, what some of the activities are that need to be undertaken, it is still so multidimensional that it's that it's proving very difficult for investors to apply effective scrutiny. So I think really we have to be incredibly modest about what this activity of linking ESG targets to pay is going to achieve. And we shouldn't expect it to achieve that much in cases where we have a board and an executive team 
that does not have an authentic intent to do better on these things. I think that gives some really concrete insight to, to people who, who might be thinking about this these days. And, and it, um, it launches into another question I had in the back of my mind, which is there's also the idea around that you might want to appoint one person on the board, designate this person as responsible for ESG with a, with a pretty broad mandate, um, rather than setting specific targets as an investor. Basically, you would say, well, you are, you are our person on the board that you know, has got to be under control of all the ESG stuff in the company, whatever it may be. And then it's more you know, a, 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 a career risk uh, approach, let's say, for, for this person. They, they just have to be on top of that thing. They, they need to perhaps, where appropriate, set targets or, or exercise their... The monitoring, um, the the monitoring function. So, 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 what do you think of that? I mean, that would be a form of delegation, right? And I've I've heard investors speak about that that they think it's very important that there's a go-to person on the board that they can, you know, uh, approach regard regarding these issues and you know potentially uh, vote on on how well they did at the AGM. Yeah, I I'm, I have to say I'm, I'm I'm not a fan of dividing up board responsibilities in 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 that way. Um, you know, I think that um, obviously directors individually have duties to the company, but it's the board as a whole that is that is accountable to shareholders. And um, you know, and I think that when you start identifying individuals to have these roles, um, you know, there's a real risk that in a way that becomes detached from the rest of the board discussions. I mean, what I'd be looking for really as an investor, not is there some nominated sort of person with an ESG hat on, which sort of encourages the idea of ESG as being this kind of separate thing rather than integrated into strategy. I'd be looking instead at whether, you know, the strategy integrates ESG properly, which is, you know, where would I be going for that? The chair and the CEO in the first instance, but actually is there also a sustainability committee or other appropriate scrutinizing governance that enables some of those impacts to be, um, you know, to be assessed? It, it feels to me a little bit like sort of, you know, box ticking. I'm not sure what this individual director, you know, is really going to do or achieve by themselves. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a big fan of, of 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 that as an approach. I think it's again unlikely to provide a sort of adequate counterweight to you know a a well put together board that genuinely believes that sustainability is an important part of strategy. I mean that for me, the chair sets the tone on that. The CEO that they that that, that is appointed is obviously pivotal, and if you don't get that right. You know, none of these other devices are really going to compensate for that, I don't think. Towards the end, and I think we are approaching the end, I'd like to zoom out a little bit. So, you know, we've, we've, we went really into the into the weeds of, of executive compensation and, and whether linking it to ESG is a good idea and under what circumstances. So if we zoom out a little bit, you are thinking a lot about these sort of great challenges of our time, how important or helpful are ESG incentives and, and perhaps sustainable investing in, in the bigger scheme of things? And, and you see it, you know, as, you know, important complements that, that need to be there. Uh, how, where would you position that? And then what's your view? Yeah, I mean, so if we, if we talk about sustainable investing kind of approaches generally, of which encouraging the adoption of ESG targets in pay might be, might be a part. But I think, I think it is useful, right? Because I think it, 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 it is part of um, creating an environment where people recognize that these things are, are important to a range of stakeholders. I think, however, we do have to be quite modest about what they can achieve. And they certainly can't create correct for major kind of mispriced externalities. And I think this sort of zone of discretion idea that we were discussing earlier really applies for sustainable investing, you know, more broadly. So I think the idea that sustainable investing can somehow correct for the fact that we don't adequately price carbon, whether explicitly or implicitly. I think the idea that it can correct for that is just for the birds. And, and I think that when we try to use sustainable investing to correct for that, we get all sorts of perverse consequences. 
either because we have listed companies that shunt the dirty stuff off into the private space or state-owned companies, or we get, you know, greenwashing or, you know, all manner of other kind of um, ills. But having said that, I think, you know, investors and corporates do influence the environment in which policy gets made, which is what we really need. And so I think sustainable investors, rather than thinking, how are we impacting a particular outcome, should also be asking, or maybe even more so, asking, how are we influencing the environment in which outcomes can be achieved? And, and that's a subtly different approach, because what it means is that you recognize that in the current system we have, there are certain things that commercially companies just aren't going to do. And therefore, we shouldn't just ask them to do it. Otherwise, we shouldn't be surprised if we get a perverse unintended consequence. But there are other areas, actually, within that zone of discretion where sustainable investing can help productively shift the dial. And, and, and that's that there, there, I think, sustainable investors need to discriminate between those two. And I think that also holds into how it flows through into pay. Yes. Yeah, I very much relate to that argument around modesty, right? Let's let's not expect the world from 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 that idea. Um, but within the areas where there is scope, uh, let's let's look carefully for for what might work. I, I think that's a really uh, that's a really nice way to put it. Yeah, because because the other thing that's often sort of said, which I think is mistaken, is to say, well, we need policy, right? And and therefore, you know, we we just need to wait until policy. Yeah, where out. does it come from? But that's kind of not how politics works, <laughs> yeah. right? You know, so policy is created in an environment and politicians never do anything that they don't think people are going to embrace and want. And so, you know, it is really important for investors to kind of try and create that environment and for corporates to create that environment where actually politicians receive the signals that this is going to, this is wanted, it's going to be embraced. You know, whereas too often what we see is actually it's fought tooth and nail by vested interests, you know. So I think there's a role for the sustainable investing to try and provide a counterbalance um, to that. But that's where I think this focus on creating the right environment for the right policy to happen on the big externalities is way, way more important than this pretense that sustainable investing can itself correct for the externality. Right. And, and But there seems to be less perhaps not enough attention on the, on that role of, of investors, sustainable investors, particularly perhaps to, you know, probably we also don't want them to be driving the policy process exactly, but, you know, to, to put their thing, their thumb on the scale a little bit when in, in the issues and, and periods that matter. I, I think so. I mean, we have, you know, very well organized, particularly in the U S very well organized vested interests on the fossil fuel side of the equation who have a very simple, clear objective, which is we need to stop the next bit of climate regulation, right? And they deploy all of the dark arts of political influence to achieve that objective. Mm. And then on the financial industry side, we have people who say, we want policy, right? And they put out statements that say, we want policy. But in the conversations that the CEOs of these major banks and asset managers and insurers have with chancellors, with civil servants, what are they really asking for in those meetings? Are they using that influence to argue for better climate policy? I don't think so. I think they're adopting much narrower, more immediate objectives that relate to regulation as it affects their businesses directly. So, you know, I do think that we need to be thinking much more about, you know, how can how can proponents of this view in the finance industry that we need better climate regulation, how can they candidly be a little bit more aggressive in asserting that view? in how they interact with policymakers. Yes. So you've already perhaps gone into that, but but to cap it off, I'd, I'd like to give you the opportunity to, you know, ask what would you wish would happen in this space over the next few years? What, what's one of your your wishes, your secret wishes here? Are we talking about executive pay? Well, to yeah, with? I mean, you can, well, maybe around that area, yes. Yeah, I mean, let me let me start with, with, with pay. I mean, I, I'd like us to... I mean, you know, it, it may be that the horse has bolted on this one, right? But I would like us to focus on the 10 to 15% of companies where putting ESG targets in pay could really work well, uh, encourage adoption in those companies, figure out what does and doesn't work, and then spread the practice rather than going, you know, full tilt at having everybody put these pay targets in. When it comes to um, sustainable investing more generally, um, 
you know, I would I would like to see you know this focus on shifting from trying to direct outcomes to trying to enable and facilitate an environment where good outcomes happen. And I think that's a subtle but very, very important difference in what sustainable investors would do. And I think adopting that approach can also overcome some of the problems that sustainable investing has kind of walked into in relation to accusations around political overreach or um, or conflicts with, with fiduciary duty. Um, because I think that whilst... 95% of what's happening in the ESG backlash is completely bonkers and overblown. There is also a grain of truth in it, um, which I think the sustainable investing industry needs to recognize and address. Right. Okay. So lots of work to do for the next couple of years. Tom, thank you so much. I learned a ton. I'm sure our listeners will, will greatly benefit from this conversation. Um, so with that, well, thank you very, very much for being on the show. It's been a pleasure. No, thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Innovations in Sustainable Finance. A University of St. Gallen podcast by Julian Kölbel.